So welcome uh, to the research seminar sponsored by the College of Public Health and Human Sciences here at Oregon State University. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm Marie Harvey. I'm the Associate Dean for Research. And I'm pleased that you have joined the seminar today. I'm also pleased to introduce Denise Hines, who is a professor in the Health Management and Policy Program here in the college. Um, she has joined us to provide an introduction for today's speaker and to moderate the session. And she'll also provide a few more instructions for the format of this seminar. I, would, I wanna give a gentle reminder to the graduate students in the audience that uh, Dr. Rice will be meeting with graduate students following the presentation for an informal Q&A session and conversation. So you, we, I did send out that, that Zoom link to all, but if you lost it or didn't get it, email me and I'll send it to you. Um, so without further delay, I'm pleased uh, to introduce um, Dr. Denise Hines. Denise, take it away. Thank you, Marie. Um, I'm pleased to um, uh, have everyone join us today. Um, and as Dr. Harvey has mentioned, we've muted all your mics. So uh, asking questions today, if you would kindly use the Q&A feature in Zoom and we'll be moderating it and uh, repeating questions for our guests at the end of the lecture. Um, I want to uh, proudly introduce uh, Thomas Rice. Uh, Tom Rice is a position of distinguished professor at the Department of Health Policy and Management at UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. He's a health economist and prior to joining the faculty at UCLA in 1991, he was a faculty member at the University of North Carolina School of Public Health, which is where I got to know Tom. Um, he's also the 2020 AHRQs recipient for the John M. Eisenberg Excellence in Mentorship Award. His upcoming book, Health Insurance Systems in High Income Countries, will be published uh, later this year. And today he will be talking to us about health insurance systems uh, international comparisons. Tom, thank you for being here and we look forward to hearing your remarks today. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Denise and Marie. Um, delighted to be here. My only regret is that we can't do it in person, but pretty, pretty soon we'll start being doing things in person again. Uh, thanks very much for, happy, uh, for having me today. I'm really happy to be able to talk about, uh, about health insurance systems. I'm going to be talking about 10 different health insurance systems in a uh, high income uh, country. So let's just uh, begin. So I have to begin with something of a downer, which I'm going to start with all the caveats. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on this slide and then zip through the other slides, basically, because I think that there are a lot of caveats that you need to keep in mind when comparing health insurance systems. Um, and the first one is that, you know, if you ask me, like, what's the best country, I'm not going to be able to give you an answer. And I don't think other people will be able to do that, too. That there really isn't a best country or a best system or maybe even close to it. There's just a little agreement on which are the highest performing systems. I mean, just give you some examples. The Commonwealth Fund, the U.S. Foundation, uh, does surveys of the citizens of uh, 10 different countries, uh, 11 different countries. Um, in, um, in their survey, the U.S. overall comes out last. Uh, France and Canada come out ninth and tenth, but France was awarded the best system in the world by the WHO many years ago, and Canada is often uh, pointed to by people on the left as the prototypical system. So there's a great deal of variation. Another example, the U.K., uh, that's listed as the best system by the Commonwealth Fund, but people um, uh, decry the long waiting list, and also it comes in 10th place out of 11 in the fund's measures of healthcare outcomes. Again, it's not clear what the best system is. The US looks pretty bad in a lot of measures, but it looks great in certain things. For example, cancer prevention and death rates from, uh, can't, from uh, things like breast cancer. Um, so it's hard to pick a country, but you can't even pick a system. Like two of the countries that come out pretty well in a lot of the ratings are the Netherlands and the UK. They have entirely different systems. The Netherlands has a system based on managed competition. The UK system is based on, um, is based on um, really more top-down government. They both work well. So there isn't even one best system type. So that's um, one caveat I wanted to provide. A second one 
is that even if you found a system or a country you like, you can't just grab and take it. And there are a couple of reasons for this. One is that different people want different things. People in different countries want different things. Uh, so it's not clear it would work so well in another country. But um, also, if you tried to grab another country system and put it in your country, it might not work the same way. Like one thing we know, and I'll show you later, is that prices are way higher in the US than in other countries. If you were to take one of their systems and plop it down in the US, would we be able to achieve prices that low? Probably not. Probably there'd be uh, political uh, obstacles in order to uh, reduce prices. A third caveat, um, disappointing to many, is that fundamental change is only happens rarely in healthcare systems. That incrementalism is the norm, and maybe what we have to hope for is big increments. Um, I mean, as the one fundamental change I can think of was the UK over 70 years ago in 1948 when it started the National Health Service, but it's hard to come up with other really fundamental changes that happen quickly in a healthcare system. The Dutch had a big change in 2006, but it's 20 years in the making. Canada had a big change in the 1970s when it went to a national health system, but provinces had been doing that over the previous 15 years. So these things generally happen incrementally and generally happen over a period of time. I wouldn't expect anything dramatic really soon in the United States. Um, a fourth thing is that, as you all know, health indicators often reflect social determinants more than the success of a healthcare system. I'll show you a couple slides in a moment. I think I accidentally showed you one already. Um, if you were to compare uh, infant mortality rates, like Massachusetts is way lower than Mississippi, is it due to SES or is it due to the healthcare system? Well, what you find is that Massachusetts has fairly similar infant mortality rates to a lot of Western European countries. Uh, but again, you don't really know. It, you really don't know what is the healthcare system and what is the situation of the people coming into the healthcare system. Um, and, but I will say that um, the US system by most measures, I say is a massive underperformer. So I alluded to the next two slides. So differences in what we have coming into our healthcare system here, are obesity rates. Uh, if I put Japan in there, it would have been 4%. So uh, it's hard for a healthcare system to solve problems like this. It can contribute, but it's difficult to solve. Another one here diabetes and hypertension hospital discharges. Well, actually, Germany has the uh, highest rates, but the US is up, is up there as well, um, much higher um, than, uh, say, the Netherlands, which is an, another country that is like our system and relying on a managed competition. So if the Dutch perform better than us, you know, is it because they're doing managed competition better? Or is it because people are coming into the system uh, healthier than, uh, than into our system? So anyway, there's only so much we can learn from these cross-national comparisons, but I think the important thing is there are important things that we can learn, and that's what I'm going to be going over today. So as I say, I'm going to I have a lot of slides, um, but I'm going to be zipping through them and happy to answer questions. Uh, afterwards. Uh, so the three things I'll go over today, uh, comparing some statistics on different countries' performance, and then I'm going to talk about each of 10 countries really, really briefly. There'll be two slides on each country, just to give you some background. Uh, the book I've, that, that I've just written uh, has a chapter on each of the country as well as evaluates the performance with regard to equity and efficiency. And the last thing I'll look at very briefly at the end is what system traits provo uh, promote equity and efficiency. So let's start with the national comparisons. I'll do expenditures and usage, then coverage and access, then access and uh, outcomes and quality. So this is a very recent chart showing healthcare spending as a percentage of GDP. And one thing that you can see, something that you all know, is the US is an outlier. It's much higher, much, much higher than the other countries, dramatically higher than the other countries. Now, you can't really use this chart to see which country, if it, we've been growing faster than the other countries, because it depends on where we started. You certainly can tell we've been growing faster than Germany and Sweden because they started where we did in 1980, but the other countries started much lower. So we were always higher than most countries, but we were absolutely higher than others. 
Now, one thing that uh, people sometimes think is, well, we're a rich country. That's why we spend more. And that's not why we spend more. So what I've done here is um, I've controlled for how wealthy a country is. And I put how wealthy the country is is on the uh, horizontal axis. And I put um, per capita healthcare spending. And if I put GDP, per, if I put GDP percentage, it would have been the same graph, but I'm putting per capita spending on the vertical axis. And then what I've done is I've drawn a line between the other nine data points, okay? And a remarkable thing happens, at least to me it's remarkable, which is if you know only one thing about these countries, which is how wealthy they are, you pretty much know how much they spend per person on healthcare. Almost every country's on the line. Germany is a little bit above, the UK is a little bit below, but pretty much the countries are on the line uh, uh, are on this, um, uh, on this simple regression line. The outlier, of course, is the US. If you know how much money we have, uh, how wealthy we are, uh, it doesn't tell you how much we're spending compared to the other country. We spend about 40% more than one would predict that we would spend. Doesn't mean we're wasting the money. We have to look at what we're getting for the money. But anyway, it's not how rich we are. In fact, Switzerland is a, is a wealthier country than the US. So a couple other things on spending. What I want you to look at in this slide is just the light blue, the bottom bars, which is public spending. And you can see that US public spending is pretty similar to a lot of other countries. What's different and why we spend so much more money is that we, on top of that, have a lot of private spending. And that's really where the difference is in our country versus the other countries. So there are two possible reasons that we could be spending more than other countries. One is that we're using more services and another is that we're paying more per service. So let's look at each of those. And I've got a, a few slides on number of services. So this is uh, the first column here is average number of doctor consultations. So that's what they call them in Europe. But think of this as visits. So you can see here, we're on the low end. Sweden's much lower than us, but we're lower than most of the countries. Uh, let's see, we're actually second lowest. Switzerland's close to us. So we're not getting more doctor visits. Um, than other countries. Let's look at how many, how many hospital discharges there are per capita. Again, the US is low. I mean, Canada is lower and the Netherlands is lower, but we're lower than average here. So we're not going to the hospital more and we're not staying longer. We don't have the lowest length of stay, but we have lower than average length of stay. So we know that at least in terms of these services, we're not spending more because we're using more services. But let's look at some more high techy sorts of things. Here's MRI exams. And you can see that although we're above the average, we're not an outlier here. You know, France and France is the same as us and Germany is higher. So an explanation of why we're higher than some countries is more MRIs and the like. But you can see that's not the main thing going on because um, France spends way less than we do. They're the same as we. Uh, hip replacement operations, we're pretty high there, but we're pretty similar to Germany, Norway, and Switzerland there. So again, you know, we're in the upper half, but that's not the real explanation of why we're spending so much. So now let's talk about the other possible culprit, which is prices. And it turns out that, and most of you know, know this already, I think, is that the main reason that we spend more than other countries is because our unit prices are so much higher. Now, you need to keep in mind, this is something of an imperfect measure because we don't know how much quality is embedded in prices across countries. For example, our hospital price, the price of a hospital stay in the US or hospital day is way higher than other countries. But you have to ask, is the quality we're getting for that day higher? And we can't control for that. But you know, you may have some judgments about that. We do have some outcomes data. So this is uh, from something called the International Federation of Health Plans. And what it's looking at here is the private insurance prices in the US. And those are um, the, the red dots 
and we've uh, they put them at 100 percent. And what they have here is 14 different procedures. The prices that the uh, that the national health programs and all of these countries uh, pay for all of these different procedures, and it's a remarkable graph because you can see that only in one case, cataract surgery in New Zealand is the unit price higher than, or I don't even know if that's New Zealand or another country, and the, uh, is, the, um, is the price higher. Not only are the prices lower for everything in all of these countries, but they're way lower. Uh, one thing I think is interesting is Holland, the orange dots, just again, they have a pretty similar system to ours, but their prices are often like one seventh of what our unit prices are. So we seem to have a culprit here which is high unit prices. And so what I'm now gonna show you is drug prices. And drug prices are the same. Strangely, there's also one dot to the right of the US. Uh, it's for one particular drug in the United Arab Emirates. But the other drug prices are generally about half or less than half than they are in the US. And of course, uh, that's been agenda, <clears throat> not only the Biden administration, the Trump administration said that they want to do something uh, this as well. So this is definitely on the policy plate right now. So anyway, the, uh, the bottom line there is that we're an outlier with the spending and it seems to be because we pay so much per service. Now, moving to coverage and access. Uh, this graph shows you the percentage of the population covered under public programs. So the US is low at about 35%. You know, that's Medicare and Medicaid. Most people aren't covered by public programs. The other countries are pretty much all at 100%. Germany isn't because Germany has a parallel private insurance system that I'll talk about briefly in a bit, but uh, they still have universal coverage. In fact, if I were to show you another graph here, which is the uninsurance rates, all of these countries would be about 0% uninsured, between zero and like a half a percent uninsured. The United States would be about 10 or 11% uninsured. I'm not telling you anything you don't know there, but I wanted to show that to you. So let me show you some other indicators of access to care. So this is from the Commonwealth Funds uh, study. Um, this is their 2016 study of adults. They came out with a two they're coming out with a 2020 study soon. They published a little bit on it already. It's called the Mirror Mirror Report. It'll be coming out in the next few months. I don't use it here because most of the surveys were done during COVID. And so I'm a little bit worried about, about some of those results. But so I show the 2016 data here. And this shows having any of four cost-related access barriers for low-income adults versus all, all other adults. And you can see that compared to the other countries, we're not getting more for our money. More, more adults are claiming access barriers in the US than the other countries overall and for low-income adults. 43% of low-income adults in the US say they have these uh, cost-related access barriers other countries much lower. It is interesting to see who, who's close. Uh, Switzerland and Canada and France are the three countries that were somewhat close to the US, but the US is still considerably higher. Um, skip dental care because of costs in the past year. US is highest, but Canada is pretty close. Now let's talk about waiting for care. One thing you hear at the U.S. system is, well, you know, we've got our problems, but at least you don't have to wait for services. Well, that's not true. Uh, the, here they ask, did you get a, an appointment the same day or the next day? And so here a high number is good. Uh, I'm sorry, did not. <laughs> a high number is bad. Did not get same or next day appointment. High number is bad. You can see Canada does the worst here, but the U.S. doesn't do very well. It's right in the middle of the pack, uh, not nearly as good as the Netherlands and New Zealand. Did you have to wait six or more days uh, the last time you needed care again by income? And you can so this is a high number is bad. The U.S. you can see is the third worst performing uh, in, in, in this regard, depending on what, uh, which income groups are looking at. For the low income, it was the third uh, lowest. For high income, it was about average. So we don't seem to be waiting less there, but what about for surgery and getting to see a specialist? 
So this is what we what, what the Commonwealth Fund found there, which the US looks pretty good for these two things, getting a special appointment and getting elective surgery. But we're, we're not the best, but we're looking pretty good. So specialist appointment, less than four weeks. US at 80% is second after Germany. Waited two or more months at 9%, a high is bad. US is second after Germany. So we look good there. Elective surgery, 68% within a month, second to Germany, it looks like, and uh, waited four more months. Um, a lot of countries were around there. We were in the top five. So um, you can, we wait less for these sorts of services, not other ones, but a country with universal coverage, Germany, waits less than, uh, than we do. So let me just show you a little bit with outcomes and quality, and then I'll go into talking briefly about each of the countries. So this is a statistic called Mo mortality amenable to healthcare and focus on the darker red dots, which is the more recent data. So these are things that you shouldn't have died of if the healthcare system had been doing its job. And for most of the 31 diseases that go into this measure, it's dying before the age of 70. Um, the the measure is not perfect. It's a little bit arbitrary. Like for, in terms of heart disease, it counts half of the deaths for heart disease towards amenable mortality. Um, so there's a concern in the literature about how much SES is this picking up. But regardless, uh, the US is the worst among all the 11 countries here. And you can see that uh, it's actually hasn't gone down as much as the other countries between 2004 and 2014. Uh, 2004, uh, UK did worse than the US. Now it does considerably better. Uh, this is self-reported from the Commonwealth Fund. Did you think you experienced a medical medication or lab error in the past two years? You can see what the four measures are on the left. If you look at the bottom line, any of these, the US doesn't do so well. 22% people of people um, said they had these problems which was tied for third worst. So we're not looking so good there either. Uh, we look very good with regard to breast cancer survival. And you can see that we're top here uh, in, in among the countries. We're actually the bottom for cervical cancer survival. So anyway, that's, that's what I had to show you there. And um, how do I say this? I mean, so sometimes people will come out and say, I think the US has the best, the best quality health care in the world. And, uh, and they asked me, do I agree? I say, well, I don't know if it's true, but it doesn't come out in the aggregate data. It just simply doesn't. I think that most of the quality problems that we have are due to poorer access. I don't think it's due to a poorer medical care system, but uh, it's hard to find a lot of statistics where our uh, where outcomes are better than, uh, than other countries with the exception of certain cancers. So what I wanna do now is just talk briefly about each of the 10 countries, just to give you a feel, and I'm happy to do my best to answer questions about them uh, later on. I you know, become as expert as I could in these countries, but I didn't grow up in any of these uh, countries. So I group countries into single payer and multiple payer countries. And uh, the US will be the last country. So my first nine countries are countries of universal coverage. So let's start with Canada because you hear most about the Canadian system. So it has a single payer system. It isn't a national system. It's done by each province. Each province has its own healthcare system and they negotiate fees with providers. And um, they're able to keep their fees pretty low because the provinces are the only buyer of healthcare services. They have what economists call monopsonistic power. They can, uh, they can, keep, um, they can keep the fees low. Uh, Canada, a much more fee for service system than our country does. Um, it's a funny system. On the one hand, it has really rich benefits for a hospital and physician services in really meager benefits for everything else, the lowest of any of my countries. It's the only of the countries with universal coverage that doesn't provide uh, prescription drug coverage to adults. Uh, a couple provinces I think do, but that's not the norm. Dental coverage is, uh, is, is generally pretty poor. And uh, people need to have private insurance, but private insurance is inequitably distributed because it's done mainly through employment. 
So each slide, each country, I'll just give you some successes and some concerns. One success already mentioned is that uh, they, they're pretty cheap. They can keep their fees low, way lower than the US. And of course, also a single payer system is easy to, uh, to administer. So they have very low administrative costs. And um, if you think that high tech is a problem, uh, the provinces have very good control over that. And they have able to regionalize services and you know, determine which hospitals would provide which access to which technologies. Concerns is that of all the countries, the waiting list seem to be the longest in Canada uh, for uh, both specialist appointments and elective procedures. Um, in like the Commonwealth Fund surveys, their access, equity, outcomes all come out pretty poorly. Um, you know, and, and a lot of aggregate statistics, Canada does not provide a good model in my opinion. And the last thing I wrote is institutional stasis. It seems like the Canadian system, according to Canadian researchers, is not changing, changing as quickly as it should with the times. So moving right along, uh, United Kingdom, you've heard of the NHS system. It's more of a top-down system. Uh, hospitals tend to be government-owned, physicians tend to be employees. Um, it's less of a fee-for-service. Primary care is done more on a capitation basis. And what they do is they put a lot of power in primary care. The primary uh, care groups do something called commission, which is they're the ones that purchase hospital and specialty services. So there's a very strong gatekeeping sort of um, system in the UK, very comprehensive coverage. And many of you have heard of NICE, the acronym for the organization that um, decides, recommends which services are covered and only those that are shown to be highly cost-effective are covered by the NHS. Successes, really good equity, really comprehensive benefits, low total spending, low out-of-pocket costs. Uh, some concerns with, ha with healthcare outcomes, I list a minimal mortality here, and also like Canada, complaints about low waiting lists. The third of the, uh, of the uh, single payer countries I mentioned is Sweden. It's kind of like the UK system, but it's way more locally administered or regionally administered than the UK, which is more nationally administered. But like the UK, a real history of solidarity, making care affordable, and uh, does a, a good job uh, controlling costs through, uh, through various regulations like budgetary caps. You can do that when you have a single payer system. Um, so just reiterating the successes. Concerns. Um, like the other two systems, waits for care. They, the government guarantees you, you won't wait, wait more than a certain amount of time, but you do anyway. I mean, they've had real troubles being able to meet their waiting list uh, requirements. Um, they don't have a, one, I, it's sort of hard to come up with problems, but one is they don't cover adult uh, dental care, the extent that a couple other countries do. And the last of the single payer systems is Australia, which is a really interesting system. It has public and private hospitals, but um, it relies a lot on private insurance to wrap around the public program. And the government encourages people to get private insurance by subsidizing it and by penalizing those who don't get it. And the pro one of the problems is that the wealthier people are the ones who end up getting the private insurance. And what the private insurance affords is first of all, coverage in private hospitals or private wards in public hospitals. And you get, I didn't mention this here, you get to pick your uh, surgeon there. And you know, you might be able to pick a better one. Uh, you get faster access and uh, doctors can be paid more by treating you. So it can be something of a two tier system. So um, they have some really excellent health, health outcomes, one of the best in the world. But I've mentioned this disparity of ownership insurance, uh, in, in insurance, which can lead to two-tier medicine. And I mentioned here also huge disparities with regard to Aboriginal population health. It's gotten better, but there's still a 10-year difference in, uh, in life expectancy. So um, there, there are concerns in Australia. The multiple payer systems, well, my first two, France and Japan, have multiple payers but you don't get to choose them, They're, you're assigned. 
So France has a very strong role of government. In some ways it looks almost like the UK because you're assigned your, your insurer and there's strong government control and things like budgeting and setting provider fees. You need, there are nominally high co-insurance rates, but everybody has supplemental insurance and for poor people, the government pay for it. And as a result, low out-of-pocket costs are quite low in France. Uh, it has very low amenable mortality. Uh, they have one particularly weird problem where you have to pay for services directly and get reimbursed by the government. So lower income people have liquidity problems complain that they have access barriers. Uh, they also have very low use of um, generic drugs in France. Uh, oh, I'm not, I guess I'm not talking about, uh, about Japan today. Uh, Germany, uh, so now we get to the three countries besides the US where you can choose your insurer. One is Germany, which had the first health insurance system. Um, most of the decisions in Germany though are not made by government. They're made by these, what are called corporatist entities. These are consortia, consortia of insurers on the one side and consortia providers on the other side that negotiate with each other over things like fees and government really doesn't get involved very much. Germany has something called an all payer system. Those who keep track of US health policy developments have probably heard about that. It means there are multiple insurers, but all of them have to provide the same benefits and provide the same fees. So there's no advantage to a physician of taking the patient of one insurer over the patient of the other insurer, unlike the US where private patients are worth way more than public patients. The other unusual thing about Germany is that there's a private system of private insurance uh, where 11% of the people, generally people are of higher income, but also public servants and the self-employ, opt out of the public system. And there's concerns about two tiers medicine there, but it's only 11% of the population and access is really good in Germany. So it doesn't seem to become that much of a problem. It's a really interesting system. Um, it has, I didn't mention this, but uh, the most comprehensive coverage of any of the countries I mentioned because dental care is covered like everything else. It's also covered in the UK, but there are some substantial co-pays in the UK. There's very little waiting for services. You saw I've been less than in the US, even for specialty services in Germany. Uh, the concerns I've already mentioned, the first one. The second one is there's really high hospitalization rates and there's some very poor health outcomes. Although we saw that the, in the very beginning that the German health status was actually pretty poor. So they got some pretty sick people coming into the system. Switzerland is a system touted, have, touted very highly by a lot of observers in Europe. It's also a, a, a done on the state or canton level rather than the national level. Switzerland's interesting because any major reforms, not just in healthcare, but in the economy, the population votes on them. So uh, they vote on these on uh, healthcare reforms in Switzerland. They voted on single payer a few years ago and it lost like 75 to 25. Um, so there's a very strong, like the US, um, insurers competing against each other on the basis of price. Um, what's unusual and troubling about Switzerland is they have really high out-of-pocket costs. Per capita out-of-pocket costs in Switzerland are even way higher than the US, 70% higher than the US. So it's a real outlier with regard to out-of-pocket costs. But people aren't going broke. And the reason they're not going broke is that each person has a maximum of like a thousand euros. Um, well, the caveat there, that doesn't include uncovered services like dental care, but still they do have a way of keeping people from uh, generally going broke in Switzerland. Um, has an excellent international reputation for quality. I've mentioned the uh, high out-of-pocket costs. I say the second highest GDP per, uh, percent GDP spent, but maybe that's not such a concern. We saw that was right on the regression line that I showed you earlier. It's the richest of the countries, including the US. So you'd expect them to spend a fair amount on healthcare. So the last of the non-US countries I'll mention is the Netherlands, which relies on regulated competition. It's sort of like the way the ACA marketplaces work, except it's for everybody, not just the 10%, not just the uh, 10, 12 million people in the US, 5% of the population, no, 3% of the population who have it in the US, it's for everybody. What's different is this universal coverage, the low cost sharing, very comprehensive benefits. 
uh, except for dental care. And, um, but one thing is different is the government does put in some uh, global budgets and it is involved in some price settings. So in that re respect, it deviates from um, the competitive model we have where prices are determined by insurers negotiating with providers and drug manufacturers. Um, I think the Netherlands shows that strong government rules overlaying managed competition can work to protect access, low out-of-pocket costs, actually low spending, low waiting time, uh, so I, I, I think they're relatively few compare, uh, concerns compared to my other countries. Um, the US, well, we're a mix, as you know, of tax-based uh, coverage, Medicare and Medicaid and employer-based coverage uh, through, uh, through your job. Um, what's special about us? We lack universal coverage. Uh, we have really high out-of-pocket costs. Nobody has deductibles like we have in the United States. We're a very innovative uh, organizationally. If you look at organizational things like HMOs and PPOs and ACOs, if you look at payment like pay for performance, you know, we're on the cutting edge. A lot of that stuff is starting here. A lot of it actually in our state Medicaid programs. Another thing unusual about us is we don't have a central cost containment mechanism. Our costs are basically what our costs are. There's no overarching global budget. And uh, what I like to summarize it as is that rationing is carried out mainly on the demand side rather than su the supply side. We charge people a lot. We say, here's the information, go use it, make choices. Let, you know, it's your fault if you make a bad choice. Um, we don't have technology controls. We don't have budget limitations. We don't control the number of providers. So we don't use as many of the supply side mechanisms that, uh, that other countries do. I could go on and on with the US system, but I don't want to. <laughs> um, so some successes, I would say are organizational innovation flexibility, some good outcomes, but we have high uninsured rates. You saw high unit prices, you know, compared to all other countries and some pretty bad aggregate statistics with regard to access and outcomes. So my last few slides are, what system traits promotes health equity and efficiency? And I'm gonna give you an answer for equity and I'm not gonna be able to give you an answer for efficiency because I don't know. So let's start with equity where I have a better sense of that. So, what system trait, trait, and so basically I did this using all the data I collected across the countries in equity. I had four different data sources. And what systems promote, system traits promote equity? Well, one is universal coverage. All the countries had it except the US. Another is at low cost sharing. Remember Switzerland had the highest cost sharing? Well, it had substantial financial access problems. Australia has some pretty high cost sharing through the private insurance. They also have some financial access problems. Canada has some severe financial access problems because it doesn't cover uh, prescription. It doesn't cover prescription drugs and it doesn't cover dental care. So it has a very limited scope of services. And I think that might be my next bullet point, which is the benefits package matter. So the two things that often are not covered, well, dental drugs are normally covered, it's not covered in Canada. Dental is only covered in a scattered, scattershot way. Germany and the UK cover it and they have fewer access problems. Dental care is, is really important and coverage for it is poor and most people have to get it from supplemental insurance, but except in France, it tends to be the wealthier people are able to afford supplemental insurance. Um, and so what I found is the biggest access, uh, some of the biggest gaps are in Australia, Canada, and the US because they have, um, well, th th they have these problems with the benefits package. And finally, less reliance on private insurance. I find that the more countries rely on it, the more equity problems that the countries had, you know, for fairly obvious reasons, the wealthier people are the ones that, uh, that, that have it. So, um, oh, here we go, sorry. So what system traits uh, provo uh, provoke efficiency? And these are my last three slides. And this one you've seen before. And there's a reason I'm putting it for a second time here. 
which is that if you take out the US, all these countries are spending pretty much the same amount on healthcare. If you think of healthcare as a sort of good, whereas a country's richer, it wants to spend more. So I use this sort of conveniently to say, well, outside of the US, all these countries are spending the same amount. So if I'm looking at value, which is what you get for what you spend, if they're all spending the same amount, all you have to do is look at what they're getting for what they're spending. If the denominator, what they're spending is about the same, just look at you know, what they're getting for it, which is the numerator. So that sounds easy. Let's figure out which country is the best. Well, you can't because different countries perform better on different metrics. And um, here, here's, a, here's another uh, Commonwealth Fund survey uh, question, which is um, asking people from each country, how well does your system work? Does it work pretty well? Uh, do, do, uh, are fundamental changes needed or should it be completely rebuilt? So look at the, uh, last, look at the um, last column here. The US, 23% of people say it should be completely rebuilt. No other country is more than 9%. That was of course Canada. So people are fairly satisfied with their healthcare system. So that's a really important outcome satisfaction. I mean, if you look at the first column, you see they're not all the same. Germany was the most popular, Switzerland second, France third. But again, we're not seeing much difference there. But if you go to other indicators, what you're gonna find is a hodgepodge. That in some metrics, some countries perform better, others, other countries perform better. So, um, this is my uh, last slide. And so I asked, what country is the most efficient? And the answer is, I can't say for this reason, that different countries do better on some measures and not on others. But it's not just that. It also, the different people in different countries may want different things. It may be that the UK is not as concerned about certain healthcare outcomes because equity is paramount. It may be that um, the Germans are very, uh, that, that the Swiss, you know, want to make sure that things are if they're running on time, that be efficient. Uh, they actually don't have the history of solidarity that the other countries do, and they may not be as concerned about the access barriers. So, you know, each country may be trying to satisfy a different objective function. But, you know, what I argue at the end, I'll just leave you with this thought that we all can learn from each other's successes, that there are best practices out there for certain aspects of healthcare systems. And I think that comparative, uh, comparative research is critically important. So we can try to see, you know, what, what sorts of things are working elsewhere so we can, you know, consider them in our own country. So thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Tom. We do have a few questions for you. Okay. Um, this question came uh, sort of uh, about the middle of your talk. Uh, it's a clarification. Uh, you had noted that the U.S. has more private spending. Can you elaborate between private spending and out-of-pocket costs? Sure. So uh, private spending, uh, what I'm referring to there is spending by, uh, spending by people who have private insurance. So about... Um, I think about 90% of um, people with private insurance have it through the employment sector in the US and the other 10% uh, have it through uh, the marketplaces or have it through uh, other individual coverage. Maybe it's 85, 15. So I'm talking about that sort of spending. So it's mainly employer spending. And, and um, so that's financed by, uh, by premiums. And um, employers and employees share in the premiums. Employers pay more of the premiums. It depends whether it's individual coverage or family coverage. But you know, roughly employers are paying about 75% and employees are paying about 25%. But always keep in mind that even though the employer is paying 75%, you, the employee, are really paying that 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 seventy five percent because it means you're getting lower wages than you would uh, than you would otherwise. So that graph is showing how much are the Medicare and Medicaid people responsible for versus how much are the private insured people uh, responsible for. Thank you. Another question also came about midway uh, when you were talking about prices. Uh, the question is, I'm wondering why other countries have cost-related barriers to care if they have universal health care. Any insights about that? I do. 
So there are two reasons that other countries have these barriers, and they they, they do have they do have barriers. Uh, if you look at the Commonwealth Fund results, a lot of people in these countries say that cost is preventing them from getting things. So um, there are two reasons. One is that there are co-payments or co-insurance. So you do have to pay a certain percentage of the bill and that causes, uh, that causes a barrier. But the other barrier is that certain things are not covered under the public systems. Dental care is, is a good example of that. Physical therapy often isn't covered. Eyeglasses and hearing aids are almost never covered. So there are a lot of services that are not covered. So it's a combination of out-of-pocket costs, cost-sharing requirements for services that are covered and paying for you know, the kitchen sink for the things that are not covered. Great, thank you. Uh, a couple more questions we still have time for. Uh, one question asks about uh, your thoughts about costs associated with our education system, i.e. medical school and how that might play into the costs and outcomes differences that you've talked about. I don't know if it would play into the outcomes at all. I mean, medical school is extremely competitive to get into and it's gonna you know, continue to be probably even more competitive. I think a lot of people are just more interested in going to medicine now in the wake of COVID. So the question then becomes the way in which we, uh, well, to, well, there are a couple aspects to it, but I think that maybe what you're getting at, I'm not sure, would be the whole tuition thing where that, you know, the average doctor has uh, a large amount of medical, uh, medical debt. And so the question is, do we have to have higher prices in order for our doctors to be able to pay off their debt, you know, and still make choosing medicine a reasonable career choice? And, you know, you get different viewpoints on that. I don't think that there's a lot of agreement in the field. I mean, usually what I read is that even though medical debt is high, it does not explain the differences in incomes between physicians in our country and other countries that the differential in income can pay off the medical debt in, you know, like four or five years. So that may not be enough of an explanation, uh, an explanation for it. There's a really interesting, interesting David Brooks uh, column in the New York Times a week ago that uh, some of you I'm sure read, and uh, you should read it if you haven't read it. He was, he, he, he started off very provocatively uh, and he said, uh, if you want to become rich, what should you do? And then he says, well, be an engineer? Nope, only 2% of these people are in the top 1%. He goes through it and says, and he can reach the conclusion, become a doctor. One third of doctors are in the top 1% and 58% of specialists in the top 1%. Uh, so, okay, it looks like specialists are doing all right, but what about primary care doctors? Are they doing all right? Well, if you look at studies on rates of return on training, actually primary care docs don't look quite so good. Uh, given the opportunity costs of having to go to school for so long and having to pay so much tuition and not getting your income until you start being in your early 40s, uh, being a lawyer, or being a businessman, or being a dentist, or being a specialist tend to be better investments. But in terms of whether that's why we have higher prices, no, I don't think that's why we have higher prices. I think we have higher prices, I think, partly for political reasons that, you know, these groups are pretty good at protecting, uh, protecting their income. But I also think, and I didn't really get into this, that our insurers don't do as good of a job negotiating prices as government can do. I mean, my understanding is that uh, private prices are 70% higher than Medicare prices. Medicare has a lot of power. It sets pretty low fees. Private insurers don't have that power. So I think that would be the uh, main explanation of why our prices are higher. Thank you, Tom. Another comment. Uh, what about uh, innovation? Some have suggested that the high prices US pays are a premium for innovation. What do you think about how much this premium actually results in more innovation? To some extent it does, but I don't know how much. So I, I can't give you a satisfactory answer to that question. As you can imagine, uh, different analysts have come to radically different solutions about, do we have to pay this much for drugs in order to, uh, to um, 
get the innovation. Some people say, no, we don't. Other countries are very innovative with much lower drug prices, Switzerland, for example. Uh, but um, uh, other people think that, he, here's the argument in favor of the high drug prices, which is that at the margin, higher drug prices do seem to encourage more investment in R&D. So let's suppose we had much lower drug prices here and that R&D went down. The question is, what wouldn't be invented? Would it be just some worthless Me Too drug? Or would it be the next Hep C or the, uh, or the cure to AIDS, I mean, to HIV, that sort of thing. And so these are hypotheticals. We really don't know the answer to the question. So unfortunately, I won't be able to answer it. I don't know whether the higher prices are encouraging it at the margin or if it's making a really big difference. Uh, I think you'll get very different viewpoints from, ver from, uh, from different people on that. And um, you know, my own personal feelings is we don't have to be paying this much for, uh, for drugs. In terms of technology, I don't think the higher prices are, uh, make a lot of sense. That the, uh, the Netherlands for a lot of these things, as I say, pay one seventh of what we do. You know, the other thing in the US is we've got such tremendous variation um, in these prices, you, you can, uh, you can um, get a, um, if you go shopping for an elective uh, scan of some sort, you might get five-fold differences in prices, just remarkably different prices. And that to me says that we don't have to be spending as much as we're spending. A little bit of a segue on that uh, uh, comment uh, and other question, Tom. Uh, can you say a little bit about the impact of governmental control of technology and its relation to healthcare expenditures? So I would used to answer that question differently than I do now. It used to be that the U.S. was something of an outlier. Japan's a kind of a whole different world in some of this, but I didn't talk about Japan today. Um, <clears throat> where you know we use more of all this high-tech stuff but the other countries have caught up with us in a lot of these so we're not as much of an outlier and i showed you some of that before so um I, if I, you were to ask me what are the why are the reasons that we spend more than other countries i used to list high tech among the reasons i don't do that any longer i think other countries are becoming more like us so i don't think it's the high-tech spending that's making us an outlier. I think it's all the other, I think it's other factors are much more important. I mean, I'm sure you could find a technology where we're doing more than anybody is, but you know, it, we're, we're, the, the rich countries are all looking pretty similar. We're not, are looking, they're not radically different. So I don't think it's high, I don't think it's high tech. I think it's other things that are probably responsible for the US being such an outlier. And how about um, uh, maybe reasons why insurance plans tend to not include dental and mental health services, yet they're covering high technology? Any insights about that? Yeah, part of it has to do with just tradition and historical happenstance that uh, these are things that previously were never, were never really covered by insurance. And it's often hard to get insurers to uh, to uh, pick to to pick them up, you know we we do have an we do have legislation in the United States that tries to provide equity for coverage for mental uh, for mental health services, and so I think we're doing better with regard to that. My main concern concern with regard to equity and coverage for mental health services in the United States is under Medicaid, which is a lot of state programs have really low limits into how many sessions you can have during the year. So I think that that's one of the biggest equity problems. That's not a real surprise that you know an equity problem would be uh, would involve Medicaid, which is uh, a lot of the states are really strapped in terms of funding uh, funding their Medicaid benefits. You know, we've never we just don't have a tradition in the United States of covering dental care. If you were to ask me what should Medicare do next. Well, I would say the first thing it should do is shore up its Part A trust fund, which is going to go into the red in two years. The second thing I would say is cover dental care. And there are a lot of people now think this is the number one priority for Medicare because old people now 
are way more likely to have their teeth than old people used to be to having their teeth. Just like we didn't need to have cover prescription drugs when Medicare came into being, now we have to have it. We've had it since 2006. Uh, now is the time for Medicare to start covering dental care, but we don't have a, a tradition of it being covered uh, publicly. You know, privately, we've had things like Delta Dental for people lucky enough to have it. But any of you who've, who've had kids and use Delta Dental know that it only goes so far. You know, you have like a $1,500 limit on orthodontia per lifetime per child. You know, it's not terribly comprehensive uh, coverage. In some ways, it, it's, you know, it's a lot of it's really for dental, uh, dental cleanings. Anyway, there's really not much of a tradition for that. But, you know, the sort of the larger sense is, are we doing this coverage decision cost effective? Well, the answer is absolutely not. I would totally agree with the tenor of your question. All right, one last question. This might be a prelude to your next book, Tom. Uh -huh. um, the topic, uh, you know, of today was on the specific countries. Uh, but one question is about whether you looked into the new national health insurance in India, uh, if you have any take on where it stands. I, I don't know. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> I, I, I apologize. Uh, my very what I've done the last three years as I was writing this book is just sort of put on blinders and study these 10 systems. So I'm embarrassed to say, if you ask me about Spain or Italy, I'm not gonna know very much. I just tried to learn everything I possibly could about these systems. By the way, I chose these, ten, these countries many, many years ago when I was doing the second edition of a health economics book of mine, I realized that I wanted to learn more about these countries. And I chose these other nine countries, well, Japan included, because they each had some really interesting aspects. And so I just wanted to study them. But in terms of what's going on with India, I think I read, uh, I was gratified to see in the newspaper this morning, it looks like the, uh, the vaccine, the COVID vaccine developed in India it, there was uh, some positive news about that, if I recall correctly, in the news today. But in terms of the system, I'm afraid I, I can't answer that. I'm talking without my mic on. Um, Dr. Rice, thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. We've had a lot of compliments and uh, maybe more questions from a couple students that I hope that we could carry into our student session that will start uh, in a few minutes in a separate in a separate uh, link. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you so much uh, for your lecture today. And uh, we're very grateful. Okay, my, my pleasure. Thanks, Denise.